Harry Herbert Pace started the first major black record label in the 1920s called Black Swan. Back then, black people did not have a presence in the music industry. There was no such thing as rap and R&B. And although blues may have been around, black artists were not getting a record deal with the record labels. All the major record labels were white owned and they did not see a profit in black music. This is the story of Harry Pace. Welcome to another episode of Aggressive Intelligence. Sit back, relax, let's get into it. Charles Pace and Nancy Ferris Pace's son, Harry, was born in Covington, Georgia on January 6, 1884. As a blacksmith by trade, Harry's father passed away while Harry was a baby, leaving his mother to raise him. When Harry was 12 years old, he completed his primary education, and seven years later, he graduated valedictorian from Atlanta University. At Atlanta University, he found work as a printer's devil. A printer's devil is a young apprentice who works a variety of jobs in a printing facility, such as mixing ink tubs and fetching type. He did this to support himself while attending classes. After realizing white employees made more money than black employees, Pace quit and started taking odd jobs on campus. He worked at other printing firms after graduating. In Atlanta and later in Memphis, he also worked for banks and insurance firms. W.E.B. Du Bois was one of Pace's educators. After earning a second degree in 1903, Harry Pace joined Du Bois in Memphis to start a printing company. They created a magazine called The Moon Illustrated Weekly, the first illustrated African-American journal two years later. But the magazine was short-lived. He worked with W.C. Handy, who took a liking to Harry Pace in Memphis in 1912 when they both met and composed tunes together. W.C. Handy is regarded as the father of blues for penning a song called Memphis Blues, the first blues song to achieve commercial success. He arrived in New York City thanks to the Pace and Handy Music Company, which they would later establish. In his life, Ethelene Bibb, whom he later married, would serve as a significant influence. Around 1920, the company began working with composers William Grant Steele and Fletcher Henderson. Their business consisted largely of writing and selling sheet music to be played at home, commonly called parlor music. Pace anticipated that as the phonograph gained popularity and a larger audience, the music industry would change. Despite the company's success and Pace's better financial situation, Pace departed because he did not approve of W.C. Handy's management style. When he was still a resident of Harlem in 1921, Pace founded Pace Phonograph Corporation Incorporated. In order to start the label Black Swan Records, he borrowed $30,000. W.E.B. Du Bois suggested the name because of Elizabeth Taylor Greenfield, the legendary 19th century performer known as the Black Swan for her singing voice. At the time of establishing Black Swan, the label, Pace declared there are 12 million colored people in the U.S. and in that number there is he had a wonderful amount of musical ability. We suggest spending every penny possible to find and nurture the top singers and artists of that 12 million. When Ethel Waters secured a record deal in the summer of 1921 with Black Swan, she became the label's first black major artist. She performed concerts with well-known performers like Louis Armstrong and Joe Smith. Her albums and subsequent traveling helped the budding business gain popularity and financial success. Ethel Waters was establishing herself at the time in Harlem's cabaret scene. Waters, who went by the nickname Sweet Mama Stringbean, was a tall, slim dancer with a smooth voice. To record for his brand new record company, Pace invited Waters to his basement office on 138th Street in Harlem. It was still the era of acoustic recording. She sang down-home blues into a large horn 
with a highly sensitive recording needle at the other end. The album caused a stir when it was released, at the time when very few black musicians were recording at all. It became a tremendous smash after selling over 100,000 copies in the first six months. May 7, 1921, Chicago Defender read, News of the completion of the first list of Black Swan records will be received with great interest and enthusiasm by our people all over the United States. The concept of black corporations entering what was solved to be an exclusive market sparked a major commotion among white phonograph recording producers. Hey guys, help me out with the YouTube algorithm. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and ring that notification bell. All right, let's get back to it. Due to the popularity of Down Home Blues, Pace booked a tour for Ethel Waters and Black Swan's Troubadours. They visited 53 places, including Southern Town, which was dangerous for black bands in 1921. Urban areas like Tulsa, Memphis, and New York saw a rise in black arts, culture, and commerce, but the prosperity was sometimes followed by violence. In the same month that Harry Pace launched Black Swan, white mobs massacred 300 or more people in what is known now as the Tulsa Race Massacre in Tulsa's Greenwood neighborhood. The business, which had originally operated out of Pace's basement, had grown to employ 30 people by the summer of 1922, including an eight-piece orchestra, seven district managers in major cities, and more than a thousand dealers and agents in places as diverse as the Philippines and the West Indies. It turned the initial $30,000 investment into an income of more than $100,000 in the first 11 months. Despite being successful in his own mission, Pace soon encountered obstacles when attempting to expand the Black Swan label. To avoid having to rely on white-owned pressing plants, he acquired his own recording and pressing company. But this simply increased Black Swan's debt. Richer, white labels like Columbia and Paramount started to record more blues music, upping the level of competition. The game had changed when mainstream culture discovered that there was money to be made because white recording studios had the backing and the muscle and also the financial resources to take over. Additional elements also had a role in Black Swan's problems. Radio sent shockwaves through the whole record industry and as a result, record sales fell drastically in the early 1920s. Broadcast radio was growing in popularity. White record labels were luring Black Swan's artists away left and right. The label's founding star, Ethel Waters, ultimately departed when Fletcher Henderson, William Grant Steele, and Alberta Hunter left the label. Before Pace sold his collection to a white-owned corporation called Paramount Records in 1923, Black Swan put out his final album. Despite working with many talented artists, Pace's company faltered, and in December 1923, Pace was forced to file for bankruptcy. In Newark, New Jersey, Pace formed the Northeastern Life Insurance Company in 1925. During the 1930s, it grew to be the largest black-owned company in the North. After that, Pace relocated to Chicago to enroll in Chicago's Kent College of Law, where he graduated in 1933. He started passing as a white man about this time, and in 1942, he established a law practice in Chicago's downtown. Pace and his family are listed as black in the 1930 Chicago census, but the Paces are listed as white in the 1940 census. To his descendants, Harry Pace was their white grandfather. They thought he was Italian. Although the details are sketchy, it was only in 2007, more than 60 years after Pace's death, that his descendants found out his history for the very first time. When Peter, Pace's grandson, learned that his grandfather was black, he was 62 years old. According to Peter, his grandson, in his words, I always identified as white growing up. 
and I was never informed I was anything other except white. Peter recalls a carefully crafted story in which his grandfather was described as a wealthy businessman, insurance professional, and law firm partner. He said they have no knowledge of Black Swan Records. Hey, hope you enjoyed that episode of Aggressive Intelligence. Uh, the craziest thing about the Harry Pace story for me was how his grandson, not his great-great-grandson, but his grandson, knew nothing about his black heritage, knew nothing about Black Swan Records. Uh, it is said that he had two daughters, and they went off to college, and they got married, and they married two white men. And right then and there, it just kind of shifted back to uh, believing in just having being a white family. So, you know, that's the weird part for me. As uh, far as I know, Harry Pace, both his parents were black. So that's another weird part to the story. Hey, if you got somebody you would like me to cover, uh, leave it down in the comments. Uh, also leave down in the comments what was the craziest part of the story for you or the most interesting part of the story for you. And uh, I appreciate you watching. Uh, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe. See you in the next one.